And APB, American Protection Bureau, voted number one best on Long Island for all your security needs. Call 631-390-9050. That's 631-390-9050. APB. Tired of that same old, same old breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Same old tasting scrambled eggs, burger, that dinner steak, ribs, or pork chops. Why not add a little bit of spice or just a touch of heat to make the difference? Change that scrambled egg with a little bit of Johnny Fabulous's John Cena Sr.'s Million Dollar Jalapeno Hot Sauce. Great on burgers, steaks, chops, and those barbecued ribs. Hi, it's Josh from Under the Table Hot Sauce. I'm here with my friend, the star of the show, Jimmy Farrow. Yeah, what's up, JB? Nah, nothing. It's been a hot summer, and for all your barbecue needs, you can go to UndertheTableHotSauce.com. 13 unique flavors to choose from, created and bottled in a Long Island kitchen. UndertheTableHotSauce.com. Let's go chow, JB. Let's do it. All the flavor, twice the burn. I'm Rosa Mendez, and I'm here at the number one Long Island broadcast, Monty Farrow. I have the best time ever! Hey, listen, Daddy. You're listening to the number one broadcast, Monty and Farrow, Daddy, in Long Island. The best pro wrestling broadcast of all time, I think. Jimmy, I got to tell you, man, it feels good to be back on YouTube. It was uh, quite disappointing what happened to us, but we bounced back pretty fairly quickly. Well, what, what else would we do? We're almost at 5,000 subscribers. Well, speaking of that, man, yeah. we need more members. Okay. What do you think we need to do to get the people of those 5,000 subscribers to come on and, and join the team as a Monty and a Faro member? Nudity is out of the question. Any other ideas? <laughs> I don't know, man. <laughs> I, I don't know. But what I, I do have a few ideas. Well, just like Prell, they should tell two friends, and they can tell two friends, and so on and so on. Hit the like, hit the subscribe. Well, Check out all our content. But that's, you know what? That's why you're, you're the star of the show, because guess what? Members get special content. Even we spoke about it. Farrell came to me one day, and he goes, man, what's the deal? I can't even watch some of these videos because I'm not a member. And I said, there you go, Farrell. You got to be a member because this is what the members get. They get free content nice. that none of the other fans that watch this show get. That's right. You get free autographs from some of these wonderful stars that come in, right? Nice. All you do is you go to the MNP webpage, or, right, our own page, yeah. and shoot us an email and say, hey, man, I want a picture of... Tommy Rich, I want a picture or whatever. And boy, that's on its way. We give them their choice. That's right. We rock. We do rock. And you need to rock too. Join. Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of The After Show, found here only on the Monty and the Pharaoh channels, after the Monty and the Pharaoh channel. This is ESO. How's everybody doing out there? How was everybody's WrestleMania weekend? We're going to discuss WrestleMania in just a minute. Uh, first thing I have to do is say some sad tidings and rest in peace to one of my part of one of my favorite tag teams ever the sheep herders or bushwhackers uh butch passed away the other day and it pretty pretty sad to to see the to see him go i got exposed to him when i was about nine years old watching uh, georgia championship wrestling and back then they were really really aggressive before they came into the wwf and became more of those cartoon type characters so Rest in peace, Butch. So, uh, let's see. So, yeah, well, let's jump right into wrestling, the other wrestling news, WrestleMania. WrestleMania this past weekend. Well, going into it, I set my expectations really, really low. So, I got to say that it, it actually exceeded my expectations. <laughs> I'm not going to say it was a good show, but, hey, we're going to go through some of the matches quickly, some of the highlights, things like that. It all started out with Cena in theory. Um, you could definitely see Cena's age. I really, I like the way they came out with the Make-A-Wish kids. That really was a, a class act of WWE to, to do that. The Make-A-Wish kids coming out on stage. 
to with John Cena in his entrance. That was that was awesome. The match itself was what it was. It was it was okay. The right thing happened. Theory went over. John Cena looked okay. He didn't look great. He his age is definitely showing. Uh, but you know what? He he still knows how to put on a show. You know, next you had that fatal four way. What they called the showcase. I really don't want to talk about it. It didn't do anything. It didn't. It, the participants did a great job. There were some cool spots. However, the entire premise of the match was stupid. It was thrown together. No storylines were built or are coming out of it. Uh, then you had my favorite match of the night, which was Seth Rollins and Logan Paul. Those guys tore it up. I'm not going to say it was the best match of the night, but it was my favorite match of the night. Uh, the women's. The women's oh six man tag match. I don't even know where to start on this. Lita looked horrible. Lita, you should thank Bailey, Io Sky, and Dakota Kai for carrying your ass in that match. Your bumps were horrible. The moves you did looked horrible. They they carried you. That's sad. On the other hand, Trish. The couple of moves you pulled off looked great. Becky, you're always amazing. And as far as damage control, Io Sky has got some future. I, I've read a little bit about how, how much she's performed on the world stage, but she's awesome. Uh, Bailey's Bailey. Uh, Dakota Kai, she's she's pretty good too. So, you know, the oddball on this was, was, was Trish. Everybody else really, they did their best, but that match was horrible. I'm sorry. Out of that, you had the next match, which was a pretty damn good match. I, I give it a four star. I can't give it a five star because there were a couple botches there. But Rhea and and Charlotte are awesome. They tore up. Those women have my respect and then some. How? Wow. With those two in the women's division, it has a future. It, the future is limitless. Unfortunately, I've heard that Charlotte's going to take some more time off. I guess there's a bodybuilding competition somewhere that she wants to take part of in August, and she has to prepare for it. Uh, there's also talk of her wanting to have kids. So I'm not really sure when we're going to see Charlotte again, but you know what? She passed the torch to a to a great competitor in Rhea there, and Rhea is going gonna, is gonna to carry the division. And She was probably the, the biggest highlight of... Uh, of rock confronting bianca there so let's see what did we have next we had oh the mcafee miz thing that was that was what it was I'm not even gonna go over it next you had what i would say is the best match of the night which was owen zane against the usos those guys tore it up they put on a great story they really they are on the top of their game. Those four guys are all, all great competitors. And they did, sh they showed that in a tag team match, you can tell a story. Vince McMahon, see that? See that? There could be a strong tag team division. <laughs> uh, we know that Vince isn't a, a fan of tag teams. And I love tag teams. I, I love the days back when we, we had the Rock and Roll Express, the Midnight Express, the Road Warriors, Demolition, British Bulldogs, Doom. Uh, the Harlem Heat, the names go on and on. There were some awesome tag teams that really, they were main eventers. So, yeah, that 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 last match definitely showed it. And then, uh, so let's get let's get on to night two. Night two opened up with Brock and Omos in a very very short contest. I think their entrances were longer than that contest went on, and I'm thankful for that because from what I saw, I didn't want to see any more. <laughs> then you had the. This other thrown together match, man, I, I not happy. This women's showcase thing, the fatal four way, whatever. The girls did what they could in it, but that match, that that match sucked too. Uh, very very predictable that Rousey and Baszler was were gonna win, and the only other team that could have possibly would have won would have been Liv and Raquel. But Liv, Liv and Raquel got the revenge on Monday and are now the number one tag team, number one contenders for the tag team champions somehow around the uh <laughs> that rousey and baylor didn't even get a shot i, I don't know whatever <laughs> we're gonna talk i'm not even gonna talk about raw i'm gonna just complain in a few sentences at the at, towards the end of this segment so what did we have next the uh 
Gunther, Sheamus, and McIntyre. That match was, I think, the best it possibly could have gone for a fatal for a three uh, for a, th- a three way like that. They did. They tore the house up. They beat the hell out of each other. It came across really, really well. I, I enjoyed it. And the next match, I think, was pretty good for for what it was. Uh, Asuka and and Bianca. A little disappointed that Asuka didn't get the title. I think. Uh, Bianca get having it for a year. It's about time to pass it up. But then again, maybe they're building up Bianca, Bianca to be a, a legacy level champion, and and she can be. Um, enjoy. I did enjoy Bianca's interaction with Rhea on Monday, but we'll talk about that later. Right, we're not even going to talk about it. But Bianca had an a, an interaction with Rhea, and it, it was pretty cool. But as far as this match went, it was really really a, a good match. Just a little disappointed that Oscar didn't didn't go over in it. So the, then here's the MVP of the night was Shane McMahon came out and tore his quad, falls out of the ring. And now who comes to save the day? Snoop Doggy Dog knocks out the Miz for the pinfall and the new whatever the golden belt champion is Snoop Doggy Dog. <laughs> oh, that was awesome. That was awesome. Uh, then he had, okay, this match, I was not a fan of going into this. <sighs> These guys did not need to do what they did to each other. It was absolutely pointless. And that was Edge and Finn Balor in the that Hell in a, uh, Hell in a Cell match. That was horrible. Finn Balor ending up with staples in the back of his head. That was unnecessary. This was stupid. This did not progress either one of their careers. If anything, it shortened the length of them. Not happy. And honestly, this the wrong person went over. Why would you have a 50-year-old edge go over somebody that still has a chance to be a world champion again? Duh, duh. Sorry, did not make any sense. Let's let's just go on because then you had the best story told match I've seen in a long time. Roman Reigns and Cody Rhodes. That match was awesome. Those guys tore it up. The false finishes. The, it was <laughs> hands down. It was a, it was it was a great title match, even with the interferences and everything. And then guess what? The right person went over. Roman what should be over. That dude is awesome. There is a lot more to tell with this story. With Cody being uh, a face chasing the title, than than Roman being the heel and dropping it. Hey, I I really. I got to say, overall, I did enjoy this WrestleMania. It, I will give it a, I'll give it a C. Yeah, you know, there was, there were definitely, definitely some major, major, major stinkers. Uh, the only big surprise was Shane McMahon coming back. Who cares? Shane McMahon could have stayed, stayed away. Uh, especially he comes in and tears his squad. So, you know, that's kind of karma there. Uh, there were no major surprises. It really, it was just. Honestly, that could have been any any Monday Night Raw or any SmackDown, with the exception of a few matches. So, when you talk about Raw, Raw was the worst thing on TV Monday. I'm just going to leave it at that. If you want to know what happened on it, you go watch it yourselves. Draw your own conclusion. Nothing that was advertised happened. It was stale. I, I don't know what direction they're thinking of going. They had the uh, the the woman abuser uh, Matt Riddle is the only surprise him coming back, which honestly I could care less if I ever see the guy again. Oh, so yeah, just uh, overall bad bad show Monday. Really, w- for a follow up to WrestleMania, that Raw sucked. So well, listen on the next on the next segment coming up, I'm gonna get into a positive thing, which is my favorite tag team ever, the Road Warriors, the Legion of Doom, and. Uh, you know, some of their history. So hang on. We'll be right back. Sir? Ah. Manscape. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, have you tried the new equipment that's been sent? I'm afraid because it says Weed Whacker. <laughs> I'm scared. Maven, Manscaped. What are you thinking about Love Manscaped, it. dude? You Love it. it. What do you use it for? Necessity. What, what don't I use it for? Put it this way. <laughs> the only hair what? I have on my entire body is these eyebrows. Yeah. That oh. you see. These wow. caterpillars racing to the middle of my nose. That's it. That is it. That's all. That's all I have. And that's all I want. That's the so pre- manscaped. There, is you, a must. We were talking before the show. There's nothing worse 
than just hair. Yeah. Right? Hair on a woman, hair on a man, it's just bad. Absolutely. And it's the one thing that the older I get, it starts growing more in unwanted areas. Absolutely. I hate it. I'm going to ask you a question. Uh oh Just going to go out there. Oh, boy. Go for it. You're doing a deed. Yes. <laughs> Again, I don't want you to have to admit this because we, as men, we try not to admit this. But if you're going to oh, go do I a know deed it. on a woman, I know would you rather have her be hairless or a little hair, racing stripe, or <laughs> racing stripe. full retro bush? <laughs> racing well, stripe. Retro bush is out. Yes, thank you. Retro bush is out. Yeah. Um, I don't mind a small, well-manicured landing strip. <laughs> Every now and then, if it's completely, and I'm talking like baby's ass bald, mm. then I, I start, where is that pedophilia line yeah. that I'm, that I'm, I don't, I don't wow. want to wander into that. That's very interesting. Like that. I never thought about wow. that. You're a smart dude. Holy yeah. shit. So if the landing strip is clean enough for the plane to go in smoothly, you're cool with that. If the landing strip is, has, like I said, well manicured, yeah. you yeah. can see both sides. It's not like blinking lights on both sides I, of that. Landing? I just don't, I don't want, <laughs> you know, I don't want the shrubbery going off into yeah. unwanted areas on that. Gotcha. As well. Oh, yeah, look but, what you found. Ooh. I got to be all honest gotcha. though. Hey, the, ah. <laughs> the older I get, though, I don't. I think I don't think I can be as. Uh, I a, found a, it. Have, I found have it. Have you ever gone down there and like just like you, she slowly brings down the underwear? Then what is retro? Just absolutely. Retro? You're like whoa. Wow. Yeah, like I'm 46, like it pops out. Do you like walk out or what do you do? No, I, try, I muster through. I muster up the you courage to get He's a trooper. Yeah. He's a trooper. <laughs> Gotta give him an yeah, not all not all heroes wear capes. Yeah, I, there you no, go. I hear you. Uh, there you listen, go. Can't, I couldn't. I couldn't Super say. Bush. I couldn't say. Well. If you have the same beliefs as Maven does, Manscaped could help you. Absolutely. The weed whacker. Absolutely. What are you thinking? I'm thinking that I may have to, like, you know, go in a room, close the door, and hang out with the weed whacker for a little while. Yeah, I think you're a retro guy, aren't you? I like 70s adult films, if that's what you're getting at. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, well, with Ron that, Jeremy we're going to take a quick Batman. commercial break and anyway. we'll be back with this wrestling icon, Maven. We will see you in a drop kick second. Uh -oh. Drop kick. And welcome back to the after show found here only on the Monty and the Pharaoh channels. And while we're on that subject, Monty and the Pharaoh can be found live every Thursday at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch. And now they're also streaming on the Intuitive app. They're also, audio is also available on Spotify, iTunes, Apple Music, and wherever you listen to your podcast. Guess what? Wherever you can find Money in the Pharaoh, you can probably find the after show. So I, I wanted to talk about one of my favorite tag teams ever. We always hear Jimmy talking about demolition. Dem there wouldn't be no demolition if it weren't for the Legion of Doom, the Road Warriors. Those guys were the pioneers. Could you imagine in the early 80s going into a bar and those two were the bouncers? I wouldn't even go in. I'd turn around and run the other way. But that's a whole nother story. They broke into Georgia Championship Wrestling in the early 80s and became members of the Legion of Doom with Paul Ellering and quickly became a real dominant force, winning the Georgia Championship Wrestling version of the NWA title. And then in 85, moving on to the AWA, which is where I first got to see them, where they were wearing the dog collars and the face paint. Those do, I, I missed the era where they were the, the biker fit, uh Biker guys with the helmets and the glasses. I, I got exposed to them when they were the dog color, dog collar and uh, and face paint era. And those guys were awesome. You'd hear Iron Man come on, and you the pop would be ridiculous. And then they'd come in, dominate whoever it was, and, and <laughs> with Doomsday Device and go on. Yeah, you know, in the uh, Let's see who did they feud with in the uh, in the AWA. They dominated the field. That was '85. They entered the AWA and they dominated the field, uh, dominating the likes of Baron von Raschke, Jerry Lawler, King Kong Bundy, the Fabulous Ones, Crusher, Jerry Blackwell, Greg Gagne, John Nord, Sergeant Slaughter, and more. And they ended up capturing the AWA titles before 1986, where they moved on to the Glory Years, and that was the Jim Crockett Promotions and the a NWA where they uh, quickly, quickly got into feuds with the Midnight Express, the Four Horsemen, the Steiners, Skyscrapers, Powers of Pain, and more. They, they won the inaugural Crockett Cup. 
the uh, the war games they were in were crazy, crazy. When the Road Warriors came out, the crowd would just go nuts. They tried several times to turn these guys heel, and all that kept happening was they would boo the faces no matter what. The Road Warriors would get this the loudest reaction to anybody on the card over the heavyweight champion Ric Flair, over the tag champs, over everybody. They, when they were coming out, the crowd was deafening. That's why you hear the term Road Warrior Pop still used today. It was because of those guys in that late 80s era from like 86 to oh, 89. Those guys were on fire. They were <laughs> unstoppable. I was fortunate I could, I could watch them on TBS and wow. I, I loved it. So, back at, then you get into the 90s. The 90s Road Warriors. Hmm. This is where things kind of went a little bit downhill. Yes, we finally got to see them join the WWF, and immediately Vince repackages them with the, the red shoulder blades, uh, uh, shoulder pads with the black spikes. Changes the name of the team, you know, drops the Road Warriors and has them called individually Road Warrior Animal, Road Warrior Hawk, the Legion of Doom. It really didn't go over well. Yeah, it was cool seeing them face demolition, stuff like that, but they were not the team they were in that late 80s. They were the team of the decade of the 80s, and by like 1992, they brought in Paul Ellering with a ventriloquist doll to manage them. I forgot what his name was. I think it was Rocco. Yeah, Rocco. So you had this, these monsters with a ventriloquist doll and Paul Ellering. What a way to destroy a, t- a team. You know, at that point, unfortunately, Hawks Demon started to catch up with him and he and Animal started to, to kind of drift apart a little bit and you know, toured Japan differently and uh, different bookings and create different tag teams, but they did come back together towards the late 90s, and um, unfortunately, WWF took advantage of this and, and wrote a horrible angle where they wrote about Hawks Demons into the script, and it, it just was, it was disgusting, it was, but I, I guess that was the Katie Vick era, so that was WW, WWF at the time. Um, fortunately for for Mike, he, uh, uh, he ended up getting himself sobered up by the late two th- uh, by the early two thousands, and unfortunately, his body just didn't hold up due to all the damage he'd, he'd already done to it, and he ended up passing away in two thousand and three. So uh, we were we were left with just Road Warrior Animal there, and uh, unfortunately, he passed away in two thousand twenty uh, of a heart attack. So the Road Warriors, their legacy is awesome. They were inducted into the Hall of Fame in 2011, and that was well, well, well well-deserved. They were the greatest tag team, in my opinion, of all time. They revolutionized the tag team industry in many, many ways. Some people are going to say, well, they... All they did was squash everybody and no sold. Well, there were a lot of teams, a lot of people that did that. The Undertaker no no sold a lot. The, some of the other giants out there no sold. And when you see the size of these guys versus their opponents, they should no sell. They were they were enormous compared to a lot of them. When you have Ricky Morton stand next to uh, Hawk, you got a five six inch difference, and you know what a seventy pound eighty pound difference in, of muscle. He dwarfs him. He could lift him up with one hand. He could curl the guy. Of course he's going to dominate him. So same thing, like a Stan Lane or even a, you know, really any, most of those guys, they, they really weren't the size of uh, those monsters. So, you know, that Road Warriors, my f- favorite tag team of all time. I wish there was a, a little bit more uh, out there about them historically. Uh, they're not talked about enough anymore. And, uh, Yo, hopefully this gets some people interested in them. So I'm going to be back in just a few minutes, and I'm going to be talking about another magazine. Now back to, We're going to bring that segment back this week, and this week I'm going to go over Sports Review Wrestling from October 1990 that features Sting on the cover, and this was actually the influence for this past segment, the 
the uh, one of the big stories in this magazine is the Legion of Doom, a pictorial history of wrestling's greatest tag team. Now you saw some of those pictures in the last in this last segment, so we're gonna go through that part pretty quickly. But there's uh, some other cool stuff to go through, so we'll be back in just a second. Do you treat your dog as part of the family? (laughs) Well, so do we. So why not celebrate your pup's birthday with the ultimate party box? Check us out on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Party Pup Info, and let us make your pup's party or any celebration perfection. Jimmy, I gotta take a dump. What? No, I mean, I need a dumpster. (sighs) Well, for all those needs, you need to call Big V, Dumpster Rental, Long Island, New York, 631-900-DUMP. Hmm. Hey, everybody, and welcome back to the After Show, found here only on the Monty and the Pharaoh channels. So, well, back in the... Late 80s, early 90s, Pro Wrestling Illustrated was the dominant wrestling magazine out there. And they put out several publications each month. And this month, or or tonight, I'm going to go over one from October 1990. And it's Sports Review Wrestling from the publishers of Pro Wrestling Illustrated. So back then, every one of these magazines had some type of mailbag. I'm not sure if it was really people writing in or if uh, Bill Apter took the, uh, the liberty of creating the <laughs> the stories like he did the the characters of the time but if he e- either way back in those days he read these things cover to cover a lot of us it was the only way we could find out about some of the odd wrestling organizations out there so and and the up and coming wrestlers out there so that was pretty cool and while we're on that we get talk about an up and coming wrestler we're talking about El Gigante <laughs> what a flop he ended up being this was in. This is when he was debuting as a seven foot seven, four hundred thirty five pound Argentinian giant. You know that's funny. I had watched him play basketball in the NCAA. <laughs> We're supposed to have be, be dumb back then. Don't forget this is kayfabe era. Yeah, uh, we go through several several other common type articles. Uh, a lot of oh, a little bit cheesy stuff till we get to. So one of the cool articles this uh, month was Top Wrestlers Answers, Your Questions of the Month. This month they asked all the top women wrestlers who their who the competitor they most admire is. And you had Wendy Richter, who says it would be the fabulous Moolah. Wow. Oh, no. Oh, no. She says, excuse me, a woman named Liz Chase, not Moolah. Medusa Michelli said Wendy Richter. Misty Blue Sims says Heidi Lee Morgan. Oh, Candy Devine says Kat LaRue. Baby Doll says Sunshine. And I don't know who any of these other women are. Oh, Little Lady Kai, I do know who she is. And she says Misty Blue and oh, Judy Martin. And then she also gives props to Misty Blue Sims and Susan Stexton. That's pretty cool. Uh, next section of the book talk is some, a section called the scrapbook, where they go into old cards of that month way back when. So night this one they get into September October 1965 at Madison Square Garden, where you had Bruno San Martino take apart the Cowboy Bill Watts. So that's pretty awesome. And the uh, singles ratings at that time were number one was Luthez, number two, Bruno San Martino, number three, Bill Watts, number four, Johnny Valentine, number five, Johnny Powers, number six, Crusher, number seven, Mad Dog Vachon, eight, Gorilla Monsoon, nine, Fritz Von Erich, and ten, Waldo Von Erich. Wow, that's pretty cool. They had a couple of other art, uh, years. They did a 1970, a 1980, and a 1985, but I'm not going to get into them. In the next section, we have looking at Kurt Henning. For some reason, some of the Pro Wrestling Illustrated magazines were a little biased towards wrestlers in the WWF, especially when they left another organization to go there. At this point, Kurt Henning had dropped his world title 
And he was on his way to the WWF to become Mr. Perfect. And what do they talk about in this is how insecure Kurt Henning was and, you know, where where his challenges were. And, oh, my gosh, it was such a such a load of baloney. Kurt Henning was about to become Mr. Perfect, the best character he could have ever become. That guy was world title bound, and it's sad that he passed away too soon. Next section is they take a point and a counterpoint. At this point, you had demolition with three members. You had Axe, Smash, and Crush. And the point was, should all three of demolition be able to, to defend the title? You know, like the Freebird rule, any of any two of the three. So they had a point and a counterpoint on, should you be able to, two of the three, be able to defend the title of the tag team title, or shouldn't they be able to? It's, it was a pretty good arg argument, but we've had it before with the Freebirds back in, I believe it was uh, 86, 87. <laughs> uh, next, we had the wrestler of the month, the king, Jerry Lawler, legendary wrestler. This was October 1990. <laughs> and that's cool that he, he actually, up until, you know, the last year or so, he was still active in the ring. That guy has had some career. He has spanned so many decades. The only wrestler that I can think of that spanned more would be like Abdullah the Butcher, because I believe he debuted in like 57 and retired not too many years ago. So Jerry Lawler, awesome, awesome dude. You know. So then we have the article that inspired the last segment, and that is the, the pictorial history of wrestling's greatest tag team. At this point, they were considered wrestling's greatest tag team. This was before the, this is when they were just arriving in the WWF. It's pretty cool to watch, uh, watch their evolution. So then you had the article from the, from the main page, which was Sting wants you to become a dude with an attitude. It's a mail-in thing so you can get a card that you can carry around to prove you're a dude with an attitude. Well, whatever. <laughs> Obviously, I didn't cut it out and send it in because it's right there. Then this one always makes me laugh. Sergeant Slaughter in 1990. He was about to become an Iraqi sympathizer, but in 1990, he was proud of Nikolai Volkov for adopting America. <laughs> Yet 91, he was, uh, we all know what he was doing we, with General Adnan there. So we have, most of these magazines always have an interview. This month, they had an interview with the late, great, Kerry Von Erich. Again, I'm not sure if these interviews are true or real or if Bill Apter just writes them and sends them in for approval. So it's kind of it's kind of cool that some of the smaller organizations, the AWA, the NWA, the WCCW, they had no problem working directly with Pro Wrestling Illustrated where WWF didn't work directly with them and they competed directly with them with the WWF magazine. That's probably where a lot of the animosity between the PWI magazines and the WWF comes comes in. So the last part that I wanted to get into, and this is one of my favorites, because I just want to mention some of the names that are in here at this point. This is the Sports Review Wrestling's official ratings. So the world champion at this point was the Ultimate Warrior. <laughs> just before he lost, you know, this is that year before he lost the title to Sergeant Slaughter. So then he had Ric Flair, Lex Luger, Kurt Hennig, Rick Rude, Kerry Von Erich, Larry Zabisco, Arn Anderson, Scotty the Body, and Jerry Lawler. So that was that's pretty cool. But some of the names I want to I want to mention here: the number three rated rated person in the NWA was Me Mark Callis before he became the Undertaker in 1992. You had let's see, there was the other one. Oh, in most, this was the other one I wanted to bring up. So in USWA, you had an up and coming guy named Steve Austin, and he was the number 10 most hated wrestler in October of 1990 when this magazine came out. This is what, eight years before he became the Texas Rattlesnake? So this is before he became stunning Steve Austin in the Hollywood Blondes. So, wow. Uh, Tony Atlas was the ICW champion this month. So there were some really, really cool, cool things going on at this time. But 
oh, wrestling now is never going to be the same. It's never going to go back to the, these eras. Back then, having these official ratings was such a cool thing. We we all love to pick up these magazines and, and read about them. And, uh, you know, Pro Wrestling Illustrated really was, was the king of those magazines. So, yeah, thank you, everybody, for stopping by. I, I really appreciate it. Got to send a special thanks out to Mike and Jimmy for letting me come on here. And I got to send another thanks to the SOB Sports for letting me go on their show the other day. It was awesome talking to you guys. I can't wait to work with you guys in the future. And on that note, I'm going to get out of here. Later. <laughs>